I'm Charlotte Phoenix. I am the uh, Senior Vice President and Provost Interim at Medgar Evers College. And uh, Dr. Jackson, who, oh, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Jackson, who normally would be doing this, is a way doing something very important for the college and hopefully will come back with very good news about his um, trip today. But I will be filling in and I'm very happy to do so because the presidential lecture series is something that I believe is so important because it's good to get world views and world perspectives from a variety of people who are accomplished in their fields. And today's speaker is certainly one who we can say that about. She is part of the Medgar Evers family and has been a part of the family for 36 years. And consistently, in all of her years of teaching, was always evaluated by her colleagues and her students as one of the top classroom teachers at Medgar Evers College. She definitely made the top 10 list uh, more than one time. So she is an outstanding teacher, and we're very proud, uh, since I come from the education department, that she actually holds a joint appointment. Her major area is biology, but she also holds an appointment in the Department of Teacher Education. Dr. Withers has, in addition to her extraordinary career as a classroom professor, has also served in a number of administrative capacities including associate provost, the uh, first, when we first reorganized into schools, she was the first dean of the School of Science, Health, and Technology. She was also been the director of institutional research and most recently in her administrative life, vice president of institutional assessment, planning, and accountability. She has an extensive record of research and grantsmanship and has, in the course of her time at Medgar Evers, brought in well over $2 million in grants to the institution. Can I get a clap on that one? <laughs> Dr. Withers' current academic interests and research are in genetics, genomics, and education. She's committed to increasing the genetic literacy in minority communities by promoting the public's knowledge about the human genome and genetic technologies and their relationship to health promotion and disease treatment and prevention. Another focus of her work is in increasing student interest, knowledge, and preparation for advanced study and careers in genomic science. So I could go a lot further. Uh, Doris and I were at Howard University together. I won't tell you exactly when that was, but it was a while ago. <laughs> and um, she is both my professional colleague and my personal friend. And she is definitely a friend, a star, and a perfect gem at Medgar Evers College. So for those of you who are lucky enough, she is currently teaching a new course called The Human Genome, Health and Society. So if you get a chance to include that in your uh, schedules as you're moving toward graduation. That is definitely a course that I think you would enjoy, and I know you would enjoy the professor. So right now, let us let Dr. Doris Withers take us all to school and offer this month's presidential lecture. Dr. Withers. Well, it's really um, a pleasure to be the speaker at the presidential lecture series in February. Um, because this month is Black History Month. You know, originally it was called Negro History Week, and it was Carter G. Woodson, I know some of you have probably heard of him, who in 1926 was successful in uh, getting the country to celebrate this Negro History Week. That was in 1926, and he was a professor at Howard University. And he thought it was very important that millions of Americans, as well as African Americans, recognize the contributions of millions of um, African Americans in this country. Anyway, it was in 1976, that's 50 years later, 
that um, Black History Month came about. And um, sometimes Black History Month is referred also to as African American Heritage Month, that is in the United States. Now, my college work study student told, who spent some time in Britain, told me that they do Black History Month in, uh, but not in this, it's in October, am I correct? Yeah, in Britain. So it looks like it's kind of gotten to be a global thing. But anyway, Carter G. Woodson, famous African American, was born in Virginia in 1875, and he was the son of former slaves. He was an educated man. He attended the University of Chicago, where he got an MA in history in 1908. And he went to the Sorbonne in France and studied there. And in 1921, he got a doctorate in history from Harvard. He was the founder of another uh, famous and still existing publication called the Journal of Negro History. And that journal is published at Howard University, where he was a professor and also became a dean. He, like many other famous African Americans, are the people that we honor and celebrate during Black History Month. And the contributions of these notables make them unique persons in our history. But Black History Month is not just a time to reflect on our famous African Americans. It can also be a time that we reflect on ourselves as African Americans and people of the diaspora and give praise to our ancestors. Today, I'm going to talk about some African Americans that are not famous. They are actually going to be people in my personal story. And I'm going to talk about a little bit of history, some genealogy, some biology, and a little bit of DNA. And you might say, what's DNA got to do with it? Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what DNA has to do with ancestry. My story is not unique. It's a personal story, but it's not unique. There are many, many stories like mine in this country. I'm standing here, as everybody has probably been doing the math, in the sixth, sixth, sixth decade of my life. And I am, you know, reflecting on a lot of things, and things are coming together as I continue to learn. So let me tell you about this story that is important and relevant to me, to each of us, and to all of us. This is a picture. Now, this picture was taken 102 years ago in 1906 in Culpeper, Virginia. And as my mother used to say, not Culpeper, Culpeper. Culpeper, Virginia. And the people here are African Americans. In the 1910 census, they were classified as mulattoes. The racial categories in 1910 were white, black, Mulatto, and mulatto was uh, defined as, quote, having some proportion or perceptible trace of Negro blood. You will see as I talk that the United States has always had a preoccupation with this term race. And um, I, I have my own take on it, but you can begin to see how it evolves as we go through talking about um, this, give them, as, I, as I tell you this story. Anyway. At that time, they had white, black, mulatto, Chinese, Japanese, and the proverbial other. And at that time, in 1906, there were about 9,800,000 black and mulattoes. That was about 10.7%. It was not about, it was 10.7%. And there were about 92 million uh, 
people in the U.S. population. So they were about 10 percent then, and we'll learn. They're about we are African Americans about 12, almost 13 percent now. But anyway, that person right there is Edward Wellington Hansborough, who was born in slavery in 1854. That's my grandfather, my great grandfather. And the other person is my great grandmother, Lavinia Ellen Triplett, who was born free in 1868. And the lady, the oldest child standing there, is my grandmother, Rose Lee Hansborough, who was born in 1892. The last two children of the 13 children of my great-grandmother and grandfather were not born when this picture was taken in 1906. They were born two and three years later. And the last daughter, my great Aunt Jean, was born in 1908. In 2005, she was 97 years old. And she identified all the people in that picture, including the names of the guy standing there with the horse, which was my, uh, her uncle Frank, who was her, her, her mother's brother, Frank Triplett. And she even named those horses. <laughs> she told us the names of the horses. She was a remarkable woman. She had a great memory. Uh, and her body gave out before her mind did. Would that I could be so lucky. I think both of mine are going. But I got a few more years in me, so uh, I can share this story and, and, uh, with notes and uh, tell you a little bit about what we did with that, with how we found out about those people. Well, anyway, there were eight boys and five, there was, excuse me, eight girls and five boy, boys born to Ned, that's what they call my great-grandfather, Ned, and Beanie, that's what they call my great-grandmother, triplet. Two died in childhood, and one of whom is pictured here. I think she's the one holding a little doll. She died shortly, a few years after that. I knew all of the remaining 11 great uncles and aunts. They lived well into their 80s and 90s, with the exception of two great uncles who died in their late 60s. Here they are. This was taken in the early 1950s at a family reunion. I knew all of them. And you, you can, you can uh, yeah, restart later. <laughs> um, you can, I can, you can see all of them. There's one that looks like he's hidden, but there are 11 of them there. They're all there. Here's another picture. The one in the pink, that's my grandmother. Her name, as I told you, was Rose. And the one in the middle is my Aunt Jeannie when she was young, and the one with her head on the shoulder of Aunt Jeannie. Who do you think that is? Huh? Me? <laughs> Please. Well, if I am, I sure have, you know, held up very well. But no, that's my mother. That's my mother. And they were very close in age because she was the youngest daughter and my mother was the oldest daughter of the oldest daughter. So you know how that works. They got to be friends and they were very close. And the last picture is my Aunt Jean, when she was 92 years old. That's her at 92. And you would think that the information about the family came from my Aunt Jean, or we call her Aunt Jeannie, but it is not so. Like many African Americans of her generation and before, they didn't want to talk very much about the times during or just after slavery. Maybe it, was, maybe it was because it was painful, or because dwelling on the past bad ta times dimmed the brightness and hopefulness of the future. I know a lot of us have experiences where the old people didn't want to talk about those times. And my uh, great aunt was no exception. But the person who knew and subsequently recorded and documented this side of the family was my mother, Eleanor, the one with her little head on the shoulder of Aunt Jeannie. And Mama was the family historian. She was born in Washington, D.C., of parents who were both born in Virginia. 
she was the oldest child of Rose and Philip Lewis. There's Rose, there's Philip, and there's my mother. I think that was taken in about 1970 something. She was in Jamaica. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, from my mother's knowledge of her maternal family and the research she did, we knew about Edward, my maternal great-grandfather. We knew that he had three brothers and four sisters, and then that, that Lavina had seven brothers and three sisters. Each summer, my, uh, from the time my mother was about three years old until she was about 17, she went to Culpeper. And that's what she said, she went to the country. She went down to the country. She was around her maternal grandparents and aunts and uncles, cousins, great aunts and great uncles. And they were a very close family. In fact, Horace Hamilton Hansborough, who was a brother of my great grandfather, married, Julia married Jane Triplett, who was a sister of my great grandmother. So it was, you know, down there, people didn't travel much and they stayed in the same area and they married families. They didn't intermarry, that was a no-no. I remember once going to a family reunion and eyeing one of these very nice looking uh, males there when I was a teenager. And my mother said, oh, no, 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 no. That's your fourth cousin. <laughs> no. no, no, no. And she would tell me who, was, who he was related to. So you had to go up and say, hi, how you doing? I'm the, you know. But anyway, the families uh, were close. My mother knew everybody. Uh, and who was connected to who. And she told us stories about them. And then she also told us stories about this man named Bluka Hansborough. And he was the European man who was the slaveholder of my relatives on the Hansborough side. She told us about this slave owner named Bluka Hansborough who had fathered Edward, my great-grandfather, with a woman named Lucinda Wormley. And she was an enslaved woman of African descent. Grandma Cindy was the person who per persevered and nurtured eight children by Blucher, the Virginia slaveholder. She lived to see all eight of her children free. My great-grandfather, Edward, was the oldest son and the second child of her children. Born in slavery, died a free man. But we always wanted to know more about Lucinda Wormley. Who was Grandma Cindy? She is considered to be the ancest ancestral matriarch of the Hansborough family. My grandmother described her as a brown-skinned woman who always wore a bandana on her head and who stood very tall and erect. Sometimes I have to remember to do that myself because I'm not one of those tall, erect types. I'm kind of, you know. She was very tall, very erect, and my grandmother said regal. She didn't really. She said queen-like. <laughs> There was a speculation that uh, she and her brother were brought to this country from the Caribbean, the islands as they called it, leaving other members of her family behind. It seems that she may have been originally brought, or should I say bought, by the Wormley family in Virginia or owned by a family in the Caribbean named Wormley. We're still searching and researching that. She was, however, definitely bought by Bluka Hansborough. It is pretty clear that in the case, in this case, because my mother found a will of Blucher in which Blucher willed Grandma Cindy to his daughter Mary, along with two of her first children, of which one was my uh, great-grandfather. So it's pretty clear he owned her and he willed her, <laughs> and he willed her. It was, my, it was from my mother that we heard that Blucher was the one that told him that his name was not Wormley, but Hansborough. In fact, the land that my great-grandfather owned, which was 360 acres in Culpeper, Virginia, came from Blucher. We're not sure how he got it, 
Be but we know we owned it because, unfortunately, my grandparents and her sister and brothers sold it. That's another story. <laughs> Lucinda Wormley was one of 12 million Africans taken from the African continent during the transatlantic slave trade from 1400s to around the 1800s. She was, a prox she was one of the 5% of those 12 million who came to the United States. And what I, I didn't know that until I started looking you know, trying to research my, my grand, some of this stuff about my grandmother. I always thought there was a whole bunch of us that came here to the States. Not so. Most of the people who were taken from the African continent went to the Caribbean, 60% of them, and, and part of Central America, and 35% went to South America. But anyway, my ancestors were among this 5% who came to the United States. And we do not consider ourselves part of the Blucher Hansborough family, who spelled their name B-R-O-U-G-H. But we are part of the Linda Wormley Hansborough family, who spelled their name B. R-O-U-G-H. We had a, oh, this is not uncommon among uh, African American families. They slightly changed the spelling of their names after emancipation. The names that they had, they changed the spelling, I guess somewhat to the relief of their former slaveholders. Anyway, um, when my mother retired in 1970, uh, she spent many hours in the National Archives looking at census records. Uh, she examined family records. She examined gravestones. She went to Virginia and looked at courthouse records. Prior to, 19, in, uh, prior to 1850, though, this is also interesting. Enslaved African Americans were just numbers recorded under the order's, owner's name. In other words, you can't go to the census records and look at slave, look at census records and see somebody's name, you know, slave. What they basically did, they had white categories, they had free colored, and they had slaves. And it was numbers, no names. And you could look at maybe the name of the slave master and find out whether he had a whole lot of slaves or a few. In the United States, the average number of slaves held by slave owners was five to seven. Blucher had a lot more than that. He had about 40. Census records only uh, started to show slaves uh, in 1850 and 1860. And that's just before the, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. But they didn't show <laughs> any names. They just showed age, sex, and color. And they had black and mulatto. Um, under the name of the slave owner. Free African Americans, and there were some at that time, by the way, quite a few, well, not really, but more than you would think, were enumerated by names. Anyway, my mother located her grandfather in the slave schedules of 1860 archives. That's where she first saw them. He, she saw the name of the slave owner, and she saw the woman's name, who was about the age of Cindy, and then the children. And that's how she first saw them popping up. Anyway, in the 1870 census, I'm going to run through this very quickly, they had um, List, that was the first time they listed the names of people who were formerly slaves. My mother saw the names there. Anyway, the race was reported white, black, mulatto, and that Chinese and Indian. Mulattoes were all persons having any perceptible trace of African blood. Anyway, move forward to 1990s. The categories, I mean 1890, 1890, 1890. The categories were white, black. That was three quarters Negroes. <laughs> Um, this came directly from the census stuff. Mulatto, three-eighths to five-eighths Negro. Quadroon, one-quarter Negro. Octoroon, one-eighth or any trace. <laughs> and then, of course, Chinese, Japanese, or Indian. Moving forward another 10 years, in 1900, they said, OK, we're going to name people white, black, Chinese, Japanese, or Indian. 1910 and 1920, they changed back 
to white black mulatto having some perceptible portion of or trace of Negro blood. And they also had Chinese, Japanese, Indian, and other. And that's why when I told you about 1910 census, they considered, since they had a perceptible trace, <laughs> definitely of Negro blood, they called them people, those my great grandparents mulatto. And I don't think these folks even minded. They knew who they were. Anyway, in 1930, they took away mulatto and they used the term Negro and included all persons of black, white parentage and persons of mixed Indian and Negro blood unless they were predominantly Indian and the Indians claimed them in their community. And guess what? They added Mexican as a race. 1940 and 1950, we had white, Negro, Indian, Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, Hindu, Korean, and a right in other. Here's 1950. Okay? And this is when they had uh, all those categories I just spoke of. And I know you know who, who these are. <laughs> That's um, my mother and my dad, James, from Tennessee. Memphis, and that's me grinning, <laughs> sitting on the hassock, and that's my older brother grinning, sitting on the arm of the chair, and in my mother's lap is my younger sister, who was a baby then, okay? In the 50s, I lived in Washington, D.C. It was a segregated city. My community consisted of African-American people, but we called ourselves colored people. Other people, and they were all the other people who were quote unquote white, I saw them when I went downtown to major department stores. There I could not eat in the dining room at the, one of the prestigious department stores. At another, service was hard to come by and you couldn't try on clothes. At a less prestigious department store, colored people were allowed to sit in the dining room. I remember going to the five and 10 cent store. By the way, we don't have them anymore. We have dollar stores. But five and 10 cent stores and having to sit at a designated end of the counter and seeing the red bottom glasses, which we, which were set aside for us to drink out of. Washington, D.C in the 40s and 50s, from, from, well, way back up to the 50s, okay? I remember when the downtown movies, uh, movies uh, houses first allowed black folk to go there instead of to the movie houses, uh, instead of to their own movie houses that had names like The Republic, <laughs> The Lincoln, and The Langston. Those were some of the names of our movie houses. And I went to segregated schools until I entered the 10th grade. Prior to going to high school, I only saw African-American teachers, principals, and students. All of my professional caretakers, like doctors, lawyers, dentists, preachers, they were all African-American. I lived, we lived, in a segregated society. And some of you, I'm sure, are saying, oh, that was way back when. Well, I'm still here, so it ain't way back when. Anyway, I also remember that my role models were constructed from those people that I saw. They were not constructed by the bling bling uh, selected people that we see on color TV today. They weren't, those weren't our role models. In fact, the people we used to see on TV, and we used to sit there and watch them on black and white TV, were Nat King Cole and Pearl Bailey. <laughs> Anyway, who were my parents' contemporaries? Really not mine, but that's who we saw. And when we went to the Saturday matinee, we never saw any black people in the movies. But when I went to high school, and this was several years after the Brown versus Board of Education deci decision, I saw my first quote unquote white stu students, European Americans, and teachers and principals. And that was because African Americans began to agitate and advocate for social justice in the United States, as they had done in other eras in this country. 
Negroes and colored people began to call themselves black and African Americans. Anyway, my mother died in 202 and she was 88 years old. And my mother's legacy to me and to another one of my maternal cousins who lives in Philadelphia is the avocation of genealogy, exploring our family and our people. I began putting my mother's information into a computer database, I think in the 80s. In the last five years though, genealogy, my avocation, and genetics, my vocation, have come together in a very, very interesting way. Well, my great aunt Jean died after my mother in 2006, and she was 98 years old, and prior to a family reunion in 2006. Aunt Jean was looking forward to going, and we had made arrangements for her to be there. She had given us a DNA sample, and we had tested it, and we said we were going to be curious. To, she wanted to find out about the results, but she didn't live there that long. So before I tell you about the results of the DNA test on the Hansboroughs and the triplets at the family reunion in 2006, I'm going to do a QBL, and that stands for a quick biology lesson. DNA, the genetic molecule. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and that's why I guess they call it DNA. Anyway, cell, and inside the cell is a nucleus, and inside the nucleus are chromosomes, and chromosomes are made up of DNA. See, there's the chromosome, and it's a double-stranded helical molecule, or a chemical, and little portions of it uh, make up genes. So the genes are on the chromosomes, right? That happens to be the little pairing that, ho that um, holds the two strands together, the G's and the T's. I'm not going to tell you the, the names because it's not important. But C and G and T and A base pairs make up that DNA molecule. See that? So them, see them right there? So far, that's all the biology you need to know. DNA is a molecule of life. And all of our cells, virtually all of our cells, trillions of them, have DNA in them. And if we were to stretch out the DNA in a cell, it would be about two meters long. We have three billion little base pairs of those ATs and GCs that make up the DNA molecule, three billion of them. There's that little molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid, and chromosomes are made up of DNA and protein. DNA is the hereditary material that makes up genes. DNA is made up of these little base pairs, ATGCs, and DNA consists of many repeating units of this strung together like, like beads on a, on, on a necklace. <laughs> um, and it's double-stranded, so it's like a double-stranded set of beads on a necklace. And the genetic code is made of three of those little ATGCs, and they spell out the, re the, the information for a protein. Got all that? Yeah. A ch but there's sometimes the DNA changes, and that's called a mutation. And when that happens, every generation that comes after that will have that change in the trait. This is, an ex this is just showing, for example, I know you know about sickle cell, normal hemoglobin, right? Well, normal hemoglobin is a protein, and it has that. Don't worry about what that means, but those are the units of the protein, the three, pro, glue, like, whatever. When a mutation occurs that in those little ATGCTs, then you get a different part of a protein, and that's, that's the mutation, and you get a different trait, sickle cell. So actually, mutations in DNA, there are people who study this stuff, and they're interested in how the changes in DNA are related to disease, but we're not going to talk about that today. What we're going to talk about is something a little different, but look, notice, you see where those arrows are, ATC, ATC, those are changes in that little alphabet. The person who has that particular DNA se uh, sequence has a normal protein. Person two had a change, but nothing happened. So sometimes mutations don't result in anything. They're just the differences, variations. And then sometimes a change in the DNA instructions results in a bad result, like sickle cell. Now, what this is, it, it's 
all of the stuff in a cell that, that is DNA, all the chromosomes and another little piece called the DNA and mitochondria make up what is called the human genome, the human genome. I mentioned the mitochondria. Does anybody know what mitochondria are? Huh? It's a cell part. Somebody said energy. Yeah, it's a little part of the cell that's responsible for making, the ener making energy for the cell. It also contains some DNA. Well, there was a project undertaken by international people, scientists, that was supposed to take 15 years, but took 13 years, and it was called the Human Genome Project. And in 2003, the announcement was made we have found out the sequence and the order of all those three billion ATGCs in human DNA. All the base pairs, all the three billion base pairs were identified. And they found out that only two to five percent of the genome actually had the genes on it. The rest of the genome didn't have genes on it. It was called the non-coding region. But anyway, the other powerful thing was they found out that all human beings are the same. 99.9% .9 of the DNA is all the same. That means, for example, if you looked at a person in Sudan and a person in Ireland, and you, did, you, you, you match their DNA up, 99.9% .9 of those three billion bases would be the same. What makes us different is that little piece of one-tenth of one percent, which is about three million bases. That's the variability in human beings. The genome is a resource for biomedical research, but it's also a resource for studying genetic ancestry. Ah, here are human, human chromosomes. How many do we have? Well, how many do we have all together? We, we have 26 pairs, right, okay? But look, and each one has a number. Look at the ones down in the little corner. What are those? Yeah, those are called the sex chromosomes. The one that's interesting for ancestry studies, deep ancestry studies, is that little small one right there, Y. I mean the Y chromosome, not Y. <laughs> but anyway, and it is the one that determines maleness. And if you're a male, you got one. <laughs> and if you got one, you got it from your father. And he got it from his father. And he got it from his father, and so on. So why is kind of like a little record of maleness or the male ancestry. Um, what happens is that we get half of our stuff from our mothers and half of our DNA from our mothers and half from our fathers. And egg has 23 and a sperm has 23. And mother and father contribute equally to that, that uh, new offspring. Now this one you need to pay attention to because this is what, this is called mitochondrial inheritance. And in and, and, and mitochondria, um, the mitochondria passed in the egg to all of the offspring. They, are, they actually aren't, they, they, are, they, are not, they don't come from the father, okay? So if you follow the mitochondrial DNA, then you can follow the mother's line. And if you look at this uh, graphic here, that's called a pedigree, look at the yellow uh, round uh, the circles, the yellow circles, that represents a female. And if you notice, all of the children, the first one that's a male has a yellow in it, the female, female, male. They'll, all of those children of that mother will have the same mitochondrial DNA or the same mitochondria. But notice what happens in the second generation the males no longer have the DNA in the mitochondria from the mother. Instead, they will get the mitochondria of the mother that marries the male. 
Here's, here's a nice little uh, graphic that comes from a company that does whole genome kind of uh, analyses. You see the first, the little boxes at the top, purple, um, orange, green, and blue. See those? That's the first generation, and they're showing children coming from those particular groups. And then they're showing the next generation. They show how the stuff, how, the, how their DNA gets mixed up, okay? So that when you get down here to this generation, you've got chromosomes that have mixtures from all generations. See it? Yeah, and notice that the Y chromosome, which is really uh, out of proportion there because it's real small, remains the same, and the uh, mitochondrial DNA remains the same. Well, remember I told you about mutations, and I said to you that mutations happen and change DNA. Well, they happen not that frequently in the Y chromosome and in the mitochondria, but they do happen. It is these little changes in the DNA and those two things that they use to map how human being, beings changed over time, and I mean long time. And those little groups that of people who have same kind of mutations are called haplogroups haplogroups. And there are several haplogroups that are named by numbers. The mitochondrial haplogroups are A, B, C, D, so forth, whatever, all the way to Z. And the one that I want you to focus on, well, let me say this. The, the first human being, the first woman who, uh, who came about about 140 thousand years ago is called mitochondrial Eve. Mitochondrial Eve. And guess what? Scientists have shown that all human beings, all women alive today, if they study the mitochondrial DNA, are traced back to that one woman, mitochondrial Eve. And they do that by looking at the, the, what go, the haplogroupings and how they change over the different continents over time. And the one group of women who have haplogroups called L0, L1, L2, L3, L star arose about 100,000 years ago. I want you to pay attention to that one. And they're all basically, they all came out of Africa. They are still in Africa, but that's where they originated. And guess where? Actually, in, in south southwestern part of modern day Ethiopia. That's where, and that's where they found, you know, the oldest uh, fossils of, of Homo sapiens, too. That's the uh, scientific name. Then, if they, the other group of haplogroups, the Y chromosome, and Adam. <laughs> They call him Y chromosomal Adam. Sometimes you'll see Euro-Asian man, but he didn't arrive, he didn't arise in Europe or Asia. He arose in Africa, around about the same place. And 85,000 years ago, and uh, all of the human beings who are males today can trace their ancestry back to that haplogroup man. And A and B haplogroups are the oldest ones that are still found in Africa today. There are a lot of other ones. They, they, they go from A to R. There are a lot of them, A, B, C, D, all the way down to R. And then they have subgroups of haplogroups. But the one I want you to notice is the R haplogroup, which is two examples, R1B and R1A. And these, this, this one is found in mostly Europeans. 70% of the English have them, 85% of Spanish have them, and 95% of Irish men have this kind of Y chromosomal, you know, difference. And this is, um, this comes from a company called Family Tree DNA. They, they do uh, analysis of DNA and um, um, uh, Y DNA and, what do you call it, uh, mitochondrial DNA. And uh, it's showing how 
human beings and the female human beings migrated out of Africa into Asia, into Europe, into the rest of the world. And they're showing the kinds of haplogroups that you find there in large numbers. And that, you know, there used to be a thing that human beings arose in several continents at the same time. That's no longer true. They all came out of Africa. We are all Africans. This is the one, that's the best one I can get. Also Family Tree DNA had this on the website. It shows how the male haplotypes evolved and migrated and populated the entire world. Starting, uh, um, it looks like in a, about 65,000 years ago, human beings began to leave the continent of Africa. And in that short time, they, the, the women and the men that came as offspring from there populated the world. It's kind of really marvelous and, and kind of, ooh, they did that. There are certain kinds of tests that you can buy, all right? And one is, well, not only you can buy them, they're done by people who study this stuff. There's the Y one, there's the mitochondrial one, and it's the other one's called biogeographical. DNA analysis, and that's the one that tells you what percentage you have of different continents. One organization that does this kind of testing is called the Genographic Project, and it was started in 2005, and it really is a project that's designed to figure out how human beings evolved or migrated out of Africa to populate the rest of the world. The de genographic project looks at the Y and the mitochondrial DNA, and they're gonna do this project over five years. Well, that's enough of biology. Too much, right? Oh, I like that. <laughs> you know, because that's, that's my thing. But anyway, let's go back to the Hansborough and triplet story. Well, before I could identify some of the people to be tested, I had to consult the genealogical records. And it is relatively easy to trace the males uh, for their deep ancestry. Just follow the surnames. Hansborough, 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 with an O. And then eventually without the O, or the triplets. And we could find somebody today that we could test that would tell us about somebody, the patrilineal line, way back when. And so I found my cousin Charles, and I said, Charles, hands borrow, open wide. We swabbed him, <laughs> and we sent his uh, sample to the National Genographic Project. And, well, I knew who was who because I looked at those genealogy records and I realized that his father, his name was Absalom or Abe Hansborough, and Absalom was one of the youngest uh, children of my great grandfather, Edward Ned Hansborough. And his father was Blucher, who lived, and I put W there for European American, white. And he lived from 1870, 1870 to 1873. I got a lot of stuff. We looked at them because they have records for those folk. In fact, when, we, uh, when my mother researched them, Blucher's line goes all the way back to the 1600s. Uh, and at that time, the, na the spelling was Jonas Hansburg. By the way, there are a lot of white folks that study this, this, this family. And lo and behold, in recent years, they even admit that we related. A few of them came to our 2006 uh, family reunion. <laughs> and, you know, it was nice because we, we are human people, we are humanistic folk. And we say, hello, how you doing? Have something to eat. <laughs> but anyway, what we found out was that Charles had the haplotype R1B. That's not surprising, is it? No. You all act like it is surprising. Now, Charles is one, you wouldn't, I mean, he's very fair looking, but if you saw him walking here, you wouldn't say, well, there's a white boy. 
or there's a white man, you say, oh, it's one of those light-skinned Negroes, colored people, African Americans. But anyway, there he is, RB, R1B. And actually, this confirmed what my mother had in genealogy, because she had discovered that the Hansberry, see, Hansberry people came from England, and that actually, he was of English and Dutch descent. Okay? Now let's turn to the real deal, Grandma Cindy. That's the one that we always talk about. So my mother's telling us all these stories about Bluka, because she could find out stuff about the Hansborough family. We said, Mama, what about Grandma Cindy? And my mother got some things, but you know, the records didn't name people. So, but Grandma Cindy was harder to find because she, you can't follow the surname. You have to follow the genealogy. Let me see if I can show you. That's me down there. That's Doris W. And that's my sister, Vivian W. <laughs> see, she's married. Or was married. She's not anymore. <laughs> anyway, our mother was Eleanor Lewis, so you go from Withers to Lewis, right? But her mother was Rose Lee. Okay, that's Rose, that's my grandmother. And her mother was Lavinia. But Lavinia's, Lavinia's mother was not Grandma Cindy. Her mother was Betty Pollard. So we didn't find it that way, but we tested people and we found out that Elizabeth Betty Pollard, the deep ancestry of that line, was L3, which is in Africa mainly, but it was the haplotype that began to leave Africa. So that's the one that moved out of Africa, but they ch the, 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 that is the way you find them. That's the last one that was there before uh, women started to, to migrate, okay? Now, I just want to point out one other thing. You saw my father, right? And you might think that he would have a haplogroup that said AB for African haplogroup. He not. We were surprised. We tested my brother. And guess what? He was R1B too. Now, there's something called sex-biased mating, which means that a male of one group all marries, or not marries, well, mates, a female of another group, but the female of that group does, of the other group doesn't mate with the male. So you get this kind of thing in African-Americans. In fact, about 30% of all African-American males will pop up with a European type haplogroup, and you can't judge by what they look like. Okay, so that was triplet. Next, here's Grandma Cindy. We really had to figure out who the heck was the daughter of the daughter of the daughter of the daughter. And fortunately, <laughs> the genealogical records showed it. Anna Hare my cousin who lives in Philadelphia. And you know the strange thing about it? She was the one that my mother had also inspired to do genealogy. That was really, and she had actually done more in recent years than I had. So when I called her up, she said, oh, I, oh, hey, yes, absolutely, I'll do it. And what she used was another company called African Ancestry. That's the one that is owned by this guy named Dr. Rick Kittles. Some of you may have seen him. But anyway, she sent her sample to him. And she found out that Grandma Cindy was L3E1B, which is a little subgroup of L3, which is the kind of haplotype that you see in the Kikuyu people of modern day Kenya. And look at it, hair to Blackwell, Kuetta was her mother's name, to McGuinn, to Rose Lee Hansborough, the first one, 
not my grandmother, but my grandmother's aunt, to Lucinda. We made this announcement at our 2006 um, family reunion, and everybody was all excited. They said, ooh, this is great news. Because we didn't know very much about our African ancestry, ancestors uh, because of the nature of the, of the history and the culture. And I'm real sorry that my great aunt Jean were not here were not, and my mother were not there. Because my great aunt Jean, I, I think, might say, I know who I am, and I am part Ethiopian. She used to say that, by the way. But what does this mean for me? Am I Cameroonian or am I Kenyan? Well, I would have told my Aunt Jean, you yeah, neither. <laughs> the information about maternal and paternal ancestry is really very small. It's important for us to know about our roots. But mitochondrial DNA and Y DNA only account for less than 1% of the information in our, in our DNA. And, our, and we are not just our genes. We are not just our genes. And the other thing I'd say to her that when you look at going back to my great grandparents, there's 64 direct relatives that contribute to me. Okay, all mixed up. At any rate, I know my time is going. I had some other things to tell you, but I want you to understand that while this stuff is very interesting and it can cause us to dialogue, it doesn't define us. It only provides some information that we can then explore. There's Anna and there's Doris. We are two of the 80 great-great-granddaughters of Lucinda Wormley. <laughs>